right? Civil engineering subjects are given a CE code, right? Okay. Uh, so I told you already who these three people are, right? Ah, by the way, there are also practicals, right? In other words, you have to do a practical, which I will talk about in a little while. So we start once again with the civil engineering practical. We have one civil engineering practical and one tutorial class. That is all we can do from civil engineering. Maybe mechanical engineering will do one practical and another tutorial class for all of you, right? Because there are about 900 students, right? Following this, okay, or close to. So this is the way. Now, of course, uh, although it says 16 weeks, this semester we have only 14 weeks, right? Because two weeks that should have been taught at the end of last semester, they were not taught, right? Okay. So, we will have maybe 6 or 7 weeks for statics and 7 weeks for dynamics, right? The final examination will get you 80 percent. Now, 20 percent will come from what is called continuous assessment. So, out of those 20 percent, that is out of the 20 marks, 10 marks will be given by civil engineering. That is one will be a practical on the deflection of a timber beam and the other one will be an assignment that I will give you an, give you in the class. Part of the assignment you have to do as individuals and part you have to get together in the same practical group and you have to submit it, right? Okay. So, I am also going to be putting some things up on Moodle, right? Now, I understand you have been given some introduction to Moodle. I will talk more about it as and when you know the course progresses, right? Okay, so now is everyone okay with the paper? Can I ask one more time? If you don't have some paper, please collect it because you know it might be necessary for you, right? Okay, so mechanics has to do with things like forces and stresses and deformations, right? Okay, so any object like this, if you subject it to a force, right, there will be a stress and there might be some kind of deformation like this, right, or, or deflection or a displacement, right. So that is what we are looking at. We will be concentrating mostly on forces, right. So we are assume, well, there will be stressors, but we are not concentrating on stressors, right. We are focusing on the forces that are applied to objects and the way they respond to those objects, sort of mechanical engineering objects might move, right? Civil engineering objects do not move, they just, you know, distribute the force that you apply on it, right? Okay? So, for example, if you have an object like this, right? So, it is easy if you think about, uh, you know, an axial force, an axis is something that an imaginary line that goes through what we call the centroid of all these sections. Now, what a centroid is, I have to tell you, right? But uh, see, if you think about the fan there, now that fan is having an axial force mostly, right? Because the weight of the fan is being supported by a hook on the ceiling, right? So, it will have a tensile axial force, right? So, that is a very simple force uh, transfer or whatever it is. The weight is trying to act downwards, the reaction is acting upwards, equal and opposite weight and reaction. Right? So, this is having a tensi tensile force equal right through this, right? Now, if you keep it like this, right, then it will behave like a beam. If you put a force here, that force now will get transmitted to one reaction here and another reaction there, right? How do you get those reactions? How are the forces transmitted? What is the internal way in which that force is transmitted to this support and this support? is what we, will be, what we will be looking at in lectures 3 and 4, right? So, we are maybe assuming that these are rigid bodies, right? So, these are bodies at rest, right, under statics. So, the civil engineering part is called statics. Now, there are a lot of these new words, especially for those of you who did not study in English for a level. So, uh, this is called statics and the other one is called dynamics. Mechanical engineering will do dynamics, right? Of course, by the time you get to second semester even, you will be looking at deformable bodies, right? In other words, bodies that will deform, right? And we will look at the properties of those deformations. 
Then also in the first semester you are looking at mechanics of fluids. So, there are two types of fluids. I think we are talking about fluid mechanics. It is mostly about water, but something like air is also a fluid, right. So, water can be may be considered something like an incompressible fluid. In other words, even though you apply pressure to the water, the volume will not change, right. Actually, the volume does change, right, because every material has some kind of elastic properties. So, the volume will change, but by a very small amount, right. But if you apply pressure to air or to a gas, we know for sure that the volume will change because that is what is governed by Boyle's law, right. If you increase the pressure, the volume will reduce. If you uh, reduce the pressure, the volume will increase, right. Uh, so, so, this is the section that I am going to cover, right. So, that is this thing called statics, which is here on this left hand end of this if you want you can call it a spectrum right ok of that range right ok. So, these are the ways my lectures are divided. So, before we talk even about forces we will have to look at this idea of an area right. So, most of the time you know we are looking at well maybe you can call them one dimensional objects because you know this has a principal length right this length is you know there are three dimensions every object has three dimensions length and breadth and depth right. But uh, you know we are looking at uh, objects where mostly the length is the dominant uh, what shall I say um, the dominant uh, property right. But perpendicular to that length we find a cross section right. So, you might find a thin bar or a thick bar. So, so this, this is the this is the cross section. Now, this cross section has certain properties and we are trying to find some of those properties right. So, why are we finding those properties? You will find that they become useful as I will try to show while this lecture goes on right. So, today's lecture and uh, next time's lecture we will be we will do the properties of plane areas. Then uh, lectures 3 and 4 actually we should have had 7 lectures, but we have to cram cram it into 6 because now for example, Monday now one group was supposed to come on Monday, Monday was a poor day right. Then there is some other holiday happening somewhere somewhere else. So, so we had to manage these holidays also right. So, so uh, I am going to finish this all in 6 weeks right. So, internal forces means ok mainly for this kind of when the bar is like this it is called a beam actually right. What is happening in order for the force to get transferred here to this support and this support right. It, uh, it does it by internally creating what are called bending moments and shear forces. Those are internal forces right. Then uh, I better switch my mobile phone also off right ok. Please put your phones on silent. Okay. Right. So, under that we will be looking at uh, something called the principle of superposition a very important concept in mechanics right, but that is basically under internal forces right. Then finally, we will be looking at uh, determination of forces in assemblies of rigid bodies that actually is what we commonly call a truss right. So, you can write that down if you want right. So, determination of forces in assemblies. So, this assembly of rigid body is called a truss that is spelt T R U S S right truss right. So, we will come to that we will come to that ok. Is everyone ok? Everyone has your pieces of paper. Can you see what I have written? Can you see what I have written on the board? So, if you can't see, why don't you go forward a bit? Can you see what I have written? T R U S S. Can you read that? You can read it? Ok. Ok.
Right. So those of you who can't read what I have written, you can come forward, right? I forgot to ask whether you can hear what I'm saying, right? Some people complain about that in the past, right? Okay. So this, uh, this thing is a bit, uh, you know, this, this tip is not very thick, right? So it draws only thin lines, okay. I don't know whether the other one is better. We'll see. Okay, um, right. So we look at now the one of the first properties of an area. It's called the centroid, right? So the centroid of an area, or which is also called the center of area, is defined as the point where the whole area of the figure is assumed to be concentrated. <coughs> so we also call it the point that determines the geometric center for that area. So, so it's a very sort of uh, intuitive thing, right? Meaning that uh, you can sort of guess it, right? So, uh, if you have uh, some kind of, especially a, something, oh, this is not so good, right? It's too light. So, uh, if you have maybe some kind of rectangular section like this, right? So, you can fold it across one or fold it, yeah, fold it across one diagonal and then you fold it across the other diagonal and you can say that this is the center, right, center of area. But we have to define it in a formal way and we have to try and define it mathematically as well, right? Because there are some sections that are not so easily defined. Right. So, how do you define the centroid? Okay. Now, the other thing to notice that an area is actually sort of like an imaginary thing because uh, an area does not have thickness. Right. So, everything that you can observe has thickness. Of course, you can argue that a surface does not have thickness, and then you would be right. Okay. A surface. So, this is the, the outer surface of this object, right. So, that has only area, it does not have thickness, right. So, so even if you think about a, uh, a beam like this, right. Uh, so, what you, what you see here is a surface, but if you cut this, right, there also you will find an area that is called a cross section, right. So, that word is used a lot, the idea of a cross section, okay, a cross section. Right. So, a cross section is something that is perpendicular, right? this is the symbol for being perpendicular, perpendicular to the axis. Right. Anyway, uh, we, we have no, uh, you know, because, because an area is sometimes a little less easy to imagine, we use actually a plate, right. Now, a plate has a certain thickness and the moment something has a thickness, it will have a weight, right. It will have a density and it will have a weight, right. So, now I brought a fairly unusual, well it is not unusual, a lot of you would have seen this, right. So, now if you want to find the centroid of this section, now remember that part of it has been removed also, right. So, most of you would know that you would try to hang this here, hang it freely from one corner, so that you know the weight acting downwards is balanced by this uh, force acting upwards. So, that means the center of weight here, right, the center of weight will be along this vertical line, right. And then if you hang it from somewhere else, once again by that same reasoning, the center of weight will be along this vertical line 
that you can find if you hang this freely. So, where those two intersect that will be your center of gravity and if this has three points like this you can hang it on the third point and use it as a check to make sure that you have not made any mistakes in your experiment in your little experiment right. So, that is the way we find the center of gravity. Now, to do it mathematically we have a more formal method of doing it right and that is what is described here ok. So, we think about a plate later on we are going to say that this has a uniform thickness, but we do not say it now we are writing in a very general way right. So, we have three axes here right and we can have this origin wherever we want we can have it inside this object we can have it outside this object right. So, we are having it inside here and we mark this as the x axis. So, the y axis has to be perpendicular to that one and the z axis has to per be perpendicular to both of them right. So, we have a set of three mutually perpendicular axes right. So, we are drawing the z axis in a vertical direction in a vertical direction right. So, that means all the weights are acting in the direction of the z axis right. Now, we can say just like we think about the idea of all the area being concentrated at one point you know the idea of center of gravity means that we can assume that all the weight is concentrated at that one point right. So, that will be the center of gravity of that body. So, the question is how do we find the distance to the center of gravity from any arbitrary point here because this one we can choose any way that we want we can choose any way that we want, but after we have chosen it we want to find out what this is this is called y bar like that y with a line on top and this is called x bar right. So, x distances are measured in the y direction no no sorry 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 yeah x j x x uh, x distances are measured about in the x direction obviously sorry and y directions are measured in the y direction. So, I will come to that later on right. Uh, so, now before we go further this can be unlike a rectangle here it can be of any general shape also right it can be of any general shape. So, the way we handle any general shape is to break it up into you know small bits right now one common shape that you know any large space can be divided up into is triangles right. So, right at the edges you know it may not be a perfect triangle, but we can divide up any shape into let us say triangles right. So, then we make sure that the triangles cover the entire area. So, that process of breaking something up into small bits right is called discretization right discretization. discretization right. So, you will come across this in all branches of engineering. In fact, uh, Newton or, or Leibniz who invented the calculus the whole idea of calculus depends on this you know breaking things up into infinitesimally small parts right and then you assume that the area of that part tends to 0 right. So, then only you can use the calculus and you can use an integration sign right. So, you can write this in two ways right. So, you can write that this total w is made up of delta w 1 delta w 2 up to delta w n that is one way of writing it, but as delta w tends to 0 it becomes smaller and smaller then we can write it in the integral form. So, w can be written as the integral of d w over this entire area a right. So, that will be the total weight. Now, actually we take moments about the y axis. Now, we already know things like Newton's laws and things like that right. So, we know that there should be moment equilibrium right. In this case we are taking any one of these two axes the x axis or the y axis we have chosen the y axis and we are saying that the moment due to all the weight being concentrated at the center of gravity 
should be equal to all the different moments that are created by all these different parts each one of them at some distance x. So, this is what I was trying to say earlier and I got a bit confused. When you take moments about the y axis, you have to write x distances, right? Because about the y axis means you have to take the distance to the y axis, right? So, in each case this distance to the y axis. The distance to a y axis is an x distance and the distance to an x axis is a y distance, right? So, here the moment due to the total weight is w times this x bar which we want to find, right? That is the distance to the cent center of gravity from this y axis, right? So, w into x bar that is equal to delta w 1 into x 1. So, this delta w 1 will have an x 1. If there is a minus value, you put that minus value, right? Because these direction, these x values will be positive and those x values will be negative. So, some x values will be negative, some x values will be positive. You write it with the sign convention and you make sure that you cover all these parts, right? And you can write this as uh, the sigma of uh, what have I, what have I written? Yeah, delta x, uh, uh, the, the sigma of x in, into delta w, right? So, maybe, may, maybe more accurately you can write that as sigma of x into delta w i, right, okay, like that. So, so this is summed over i, right? So that is divided by w. Okay. So that w was on the left hand side here. Now we have taken the w down onto this side here, right? Now we can write it like this, or we can write it in this integral form, and we can call it integ integral of x dw divided by w, right? Okay. Right. So, if you want to find y bar, right, uh, well you, you can use the same sort of approach and you will give, get a similar solution. Okay. So, any, any questions about that? So, I try to walk around the class, especially these first year classes because uh, right, some of you may not be very fluent in your English, right? Okay. Before you leave the university, make sure you can speak good English, you can write good English, right? Try to do that in your first semester itself, right? Okay. So, learning to speak English um, and write in English, right, is also an aim that you must have, right? Not only to get a BSc engineering degree, also to be good in your English, right? Okay. Sorry. So, if some of your parents have a little bit of extra money, right, and they want to send you to an accountancy class to get an accountancy qualification also, you please ask them to send you to an English class instead, right, okay. English is more important than accountancy, okay, right, right, okay, right. So, now I am uh, reproducing that here, right, that same uh, formula, okay. So, for a homogeneous plate, we then put that W is equal to this gamma, which is actually the specific weight. It is not the density. Density relates to mass and specific weight relates to weight. Okay? So, the specific weight times the thickness times the area. So, this is volume. Volume times specific weight will give you the total weight. Right? So, uh, so uh, we say that the specific weight is uniform right throughout the plate and the thickness is also uniform right throughout the plate. So, then you have the delta w also this gamma and t will be uh, the same wherever you get uh, this little delta a's or d a's, right. And so, x bar we can write like this x 
gamma t to d a divided by gamma times t and so then you will get this x bar is equal to the integral of x d a divided by a right. So, we have expressions for x bar and y bar. Now, here this is a property of an area right. So, this is the property of an object right because this has to do with the center of gravity. So, this has to do with the center of area. Now, the way that we did it is to say that we are taking a plate and we are thinking that specific weight and thickness are uniform right throughout which is why the plate is called homogeneous right homogeneous the same all over right that is what it means right the same all over ok. Right. So, the centroid is the geometric center of the plane area and g is the center of gravity of let us say any body like this right any object sometimes it is called a body sometimes it is called an object right. So, we use those So, this is a very simple idea of course. So, if you take any uh, any body like this or an object it has only one center of gravity right it has only one center of gravity, but if you go along this axis right if you go along this axis right uh, then perpendicular to it that axis you have many centroids right. In fact, you can define the axis as the line that joins the centroids right the line that joins the centroids of all the cross sections right perpendicular to this perpendicular to this direction you can get various cross sectional areas each one of them will have a centroid and the line that connects all the centroids that that will be the axis of the bar ok. Right. So, now that is a very important property of a plane area you need to be able to find let us say the cross sectional uh, le, the, let us say the centroid of a uh, of a of an area ok. Now, I will give you just some indication now. Now, we can either use this integral form and I will show you how this integral form is used not to find the centroid, but to find another property I, I, I will tell you how you, how you do it or you can find use this summation form right this summation form which is also useful right. So, uh, well something like this right. Now, this of course, has to do with uh, center of gravity right, but you can use the same thing here also. So, either the integral form or the summation form right. So, for example, let us say that you have some kind of cross sectional area like this right. So, so sometimes this is called a T beam we use it in civil engineering sometimes for bridges right ok. So, let us say you want to find where the centroid of this is. Now, the centroid of this is not so easy to find well maybe some of you can find it maybe all of you can find it I am not sure exactly what you study right. So, let us say that we want to find it from this level right. So, let us say ok the centroid is here now in this case you know let us say this is symmetrical. So, we will talk about symmetric symmetry also, but let us say you know the distance from here to the centroid right. So, you can call that y bar right. Now, we know that this is made up of two parts right. So, this one will have a distance y 1 to the centroid of this rectangle and there will be a distance y 2 to the centroid of that rectangle. This rectangle will have an area a 1 and this rectangle will have an area a 2. So, you should be able to now calculate from just what I have taught you in order to find y bar which you cannot see immediately. So, you will be writing that is a times y bar right a times y bar should be equal to a 1 times y 1 plus a 2 
times y 2. So, that is a immediate application of what you know right. So, there will be a problem like this that I will give you in a tutorial sheet next week right ok. But this is a very very easy and very maybe useful sort of uh, way to use what you know right and capital A of course, is A 1 plus A 2 right capital A is A 1 plus A 2 that is a total area ok. So, we use it so centroid the centroid is a very important property of a plane area right. This is called plane area sometimes because in you can e think about having a curved area also right a curved area right. So, we are not talking about curved areas we are being very simple semester 1 right we are only talking about plane areas right that is maybe you can think of it as a flat area right ok. Right. So, now we are going to now give a different label for this right. Now, here you find that in this case we are now drawing this uh, set of axes the origin we are having the origin outside this diagram right. So, we can have it inside we can have it outside it does not matter you can choose where you want to have it right. And once again if this is the centroid which is de defined by x bar and y bar right. Uh, we can write expressions for x bar and y bar like this right. But now this part that is here which we came across earlier is called the first moment of area. So, we know an idea about a moment that force times distance equals moment force times distance right. Here we are talking about an area times distance as being equal to the first moment of area right. So, it is an extension of some of the ideas that we have been talking about right and area times distance is the first moment of area. So, in order to find uh, the first moment of area of this right now this is an irregular shape right. So, we have to do what I said before discretize it right discretize it divide it into small parts right. Maybe you can use triangles, but here we are just using I do not know I have drawn a circle here, but it does not matter right. So, we just call this d a right. Now, that d a will have a distance y to the x axis x to the y axis and it will have in fact, a distance of r to the z axis. Now, the z axis will be perpendicular to this perpendicular to the plane right. So, the distance to the z axis we say is r. So, then about all three axes we know the distances and r is defined as the square root of x square plus y square by Pythagoras's theorem right. So, this thing here which we came across earlier right. So, we came across this integral of y d a right integral of y d a right. Now, we, we, we did it by you know starting with uh, you know moment equilibrium right. We, 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 we talked about it by, 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 by trying to find out something to do with moment equilibrium. But here we are defining it almost as a as a sort of property of that area. So, any area can have a first moment of area about some axis right. In other words that first moment of area is you divide it into small parts d a find the distance y this is to the x axis of course, find the distance y of each of those parts to the x axis and you integrate that multiple over the entire area a that is called the first moment of area right. So, the first moment of area about the y axis is the integral of x d a right. So, we know from what we have done before now why is this first moment of area useful because if we divide this first moment of area by the total area right. Now, think about the dimensions moment of area means area area means l cubed right you know your dimensions area means l cubed right. So, uh, area times di uh, times distance will be another L and you divide it by area which is L cube. So, then you will be left with L which is a distance in other words. So, if you integrate y d a and divide it by a you will be left with a length a distance right. So, that distance in fact, is the uh, distance from this axis to the 
centroid, right? And similarly, this integral x d a over the entire area a, if you divide by the total area a, you will find x bar, which is the distance from this y axis to the centroid, right? So, so the first moment of area, which is almost something like just the fundamental property that you just thought about, it has a very useful function. That's what I'm trying to say, right? Why is the first moment of area useful? The answer is maybe if I give you an exam question like that, right? The answer is it will help us to find the centroid of a section, first moment of area. Okay. Any questions so far? Now, if you don't ask me questions, then uh, halfway through I will ask you some questions. Okay. Then it will become interesting, right? Any questions? Everyone is happy? Have you done this for A level? You have not done it. Have you done this for A level? No. I thought all of you had done this because we are supposed to teach only things you have not done for your A level. Only things you have done for your A level. Have you done properties of areas like this? Centroid, you would have found a centroid. No? Okay, okay. I'm not sure. You have a question? Right, very good. You ask a question, everybody else also can find the answer. Why do I put the A sign under the integral sign? Uh, integral y d a. Yeah, that is over the entire area A, right? Yeah. So if you have, you know, you you can have you can ha either have a limit from one to another. Or if you don't exactly know what the limits are, you can just use that area A. Sometimes it is done. That's just a, a notation, right? So it's not really a limit. Well, you can say it's a limit, but you can say uh, it is limited only to the area A. That's all we are saying, right? Because uh, we don't know very clearly what the lower and upper bound is. That's a good question. What's your name? Saranjan. Huh? Saranjan. Okay. So there will be, there'll be an example where you will have an upper and lower limit and we will show it to you, right? Okay. Right. Okay, now we have the idea of symmetry. So, this is, this is the time I ask you my first question, right? Now, you can see this on the screen, it does not matter, right? It does not matter, you can see this on the screen. Uh, if somebody asks you to explain what an axis of symmetry is, right? So, this is an axis of symmetry. You can have different types of axes. Now, I showed you that uh, thing and I, and I told you that this sometimes it is called the length axis, right? So, this is the length axis. Now, if you take any area, now, you know, uh, that particular line O y is dividing that area into two symmetrical parts, right? Now, uh, if you, if I ask you to define the axis of symmetry, you cannot say the axis of symmetry is a line that divides the area into two symmetrical parts, then it is like a circular definition, it is called a circular definition, right? Uh, so, how will you define what an axis of symmetry is? Can somebody tell me? What is an axis of symmetry? What is an axis of symmetry? Just to get you to think a bit. You have an answer? Yeah, okay. What is your name? Sandushan. Sandushan. Axis through symmetry? Axis through center? Okay, an axis through the centroid. Okay, so that's good. You are anticipating what I'm going to say. But does every axis through a centroid will it be an axis of symmetry? That's the question. The huh? Now let's stick to the descrip description. Every okay. So so that's the thing about a group, right? So, in this course, we give you a lot of group work, well, even in this module, right, especially for uh, modules in uh, level 3 and 4. So, so when, you are, when you work in a group, 
say somebody can start with an idea that is right but not completely right, other people can make it better, right. So in this case this axis of symmetry in fact goes through the centroid, right. But now suppose, suppose you have uh, uh, some kind of shape like this, right. So now uh, there is a centroid here, right. So now this line is equal to this line, right. So this will be an axis of symmetry, right. But this one here will not be an axis of symmetry, that is also going through the centroid, right. So this length is not equal, right that is not equal to these two, only these two are equal. Sometimes this is called an, now you, I am sure you know these words in Sinhala and Tamil, but this is called an isosceles triangle, an isosceles triangle, right. So can you revise that, right. So that answer is right some of the time, but how can you make the answer right all the time, an axis of symmetry goes through the centroid, but every line that goes through the centroid is not an axis of symmetry. So we sometimes call that a necessary but not sufficient condition, right. Every axis will go through the centroid, but not every line that goes through the centroid is an axis of symmetry, right, okay. So tell me how do you define an axis of symmetry, anybody else, somebody wants to improve, you want to have a go, no, you don't. How about you? Yes. What is your name? Rusit. 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 Tell us. An unique axis through the centroid. A unique axis through the centroid. That is cheating actually. Right. It is a unique axis through the centroid. We want to find out what makes it unique. Okay. But okay. It is getting better. Right. So uh, okay. Now who is going to improve on that? It is a unique axis through the centroid. But when it doesn't have to be a unique axis because sometimes a shape might have two axes of symmetry, right. Actually, if you think about a circle, it has an infinite number of axes of symmetry. So it's not unique, an axis of symmetry. Yes, tell me. Uh, Maybe. The axis, uh, Yazir. 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 Uh, the axis of symmetry which are made, uh, divide the area by two. Divide the area by two, okay, right. Now suppose I have something like this. Right? Now, suppose I have a square and this distance is x, right? Now I extend this distance by another x, but this time I draw it connected with a line like that. This axis, oops, sorry, 2x. Right. This axis, is that an axis of symmetry? It is dividing it into two equal, equal areas. So can you see, sometimes, you know, all of us will know this is an axis of symmetry and this is not an axis of symmetry. But to actually define an axis of symmetry, not so easy. And especially engineers are very poor with words, right? You have to improve. Okay, you want to have another chance, okay. The axis that the first moment is zero around axis around which the first moment is 0. Mm. Yeah, that's uh, <laughs> I'm not 100 percent sure, but I think that's right, okay, I think that's right, okay. So let's stick with that, right, let's stick with that. <laughs> Sometimes I also get confused when I ask these questions, okay. So, uh, so yeah, okay. Uh, but the simplest definition, you should know this I think, I am sure you have been taught this in your whole level, right. An axis of symmetry is one that creates a mirror image of one part of that object, right. In other words, if you have a mirror here, right, if you have a mirror here, okay, on this line, right, then if you look from this side, you cannot see this side, 
but you in fact can see it because the reflection of this in the mirror will give you this exact shape, the reflection, right? So an axis of symmetry is that one that causes a reflection of one side uh, uh, so, so that it is coincident with the other half of the image. Right, so now let, let's look at. Uh, sorry, what's, what's your name? Sandushan. Sandushan, right? Okay, let's look at what Sandushan said. Uh, you know, this idea of first moment of it. Right? Now, if you think about this axis of symmetry, it means that certainly along this line, if you take the first moment of area about the y-axis, because that y-axis is the axis of symmetry, for every dA that is at a distance plus x from that axis, there will be a dA that is at minus x from that axis, right? So, d, so if you take the first moment of area, this one will contribute plus dA times x, this one will contribute minus dA times x. So, this integral of x dA so we find that uh, uh, the centroid is located on this axis of symmetry, right? The centroid is located on this axis of symmetry. Okay. So actually that answer is not quite correct because uh, what did you actually see? The line that divides? No, no, that, that, that's, not, that's not correct. Because, he, because that's what I told you before, right? That uh, this is also an axis through the centroid. Okay? So the, other, so, the, so the mirror image is still the best definition of symmetry. Right? The mirror image. Right? So what happens is if it is an axis of symmetry, we know that the centroid has to lie about that. So in that direction, it's okay. If there is an axis of symmetry, we can close our eyes and say the centroid will be along this line. Right? But if a line is going through an axis, uh, the centroid, we cannot say that is an axis of symmetry. Right? We cannot necessarily say that that is an axis of symmetry. Now, what happens? Now, so we know that the centroid lies along this line, but if we don't know exactly where it is. Right? So it is helpful, but not completely helpful. On the other hand, if there are two axes of symmetry or more than two axes of symmetry, then we can locate that centroid, right? So look at this one, our rectangle. So this is one axis of symmetry. This is another of axis of symmetry. Now can I ask you this diagonal here? Is that an axis of symmetry? This diagonal. How many of you say this diagonal in a rectangle is an axis of symmetry? Can you raise your hand? Yes, raise your hands. I need to have half raising for yes and half raising for more. How many say no, it's not an axis of symmetry? So I need to see, okay. How many say yes, it's an axis of symmetry? Okay, right, okay. So the no's are correct, right? Actually, if this is a square, if it is a square, the diagonal will also be an axis of symmetry. Because if you keep a mirror there, you can see what is covered inside the mirror. Okay? But in a rectangle, it won't work. But rectangle, good enough, we have two axes of symmetry. Right? So the centroid must lie along this line, the centroid must lie along this line, and therefore the centroid has to be at this point. Right? So here, like, a, like I said, the circle has an infinite number of axes of symmetry. Now this is sometimes called an I section, right? Which is sometimes called an I section, right? Because it looks like an I. That also, if, if this uh, if this is equal to that, right? We we say that it is symmetric, doubly symmetric, right? And uh, this is actually an equilateral triangle, meaning that all three sides are equal. If all three sides are equal, they are called equilateral. If only two sides, we call it isosceles, right? Equilateral. 
So you can write that at the side. So in the back, can you read this? Can you read this? Okay. Right. Okay. Then we go on. Right. So now we are going to go to the second main property of this uh, plane area, which is called the second moment of plane. Right. So we started by centroid, and then we discovered actually what we are using to find the centroid is what is called a first moment of wave. Right. So now we are looking at a second moment of wave. by referring to the center of gravity, right? But this second moment of area, we are just using a fundamental definition. We, we define the first moment of area as the integral of y times d a, right? Now we are saying instead of y, if you put y squared, we, we will say that is second moment of area. So it's just a mathematical construct, right? But actually, you know, it is very surprising that all these mathematical constructs, right, have, what shall I say, they have meaning in the physical world, right? I don't know whether you have thought about why that is, right? So some person has called it the unreasonable reasonableness of mathematics. Can you remember that? The unreasonable reasonableness of mathematics, right? So we can just say second moment of area, we could even say third moment of area, right? So, we are just defining second moment of area by putting y squared dA instead of putting y dA. But is it useful? And we discover that it is in fact useful, right? We discover that it is in fact useful. So, that's one of the, <laughs> well, you, you, if you want to answer why that is, you know, you will have to go into philosophy. Right, okay, so now once again about this x-axis. So the y distances are about the x-axis, right? right? So about the x-axis, instead of y dA, we are putting y squared dA. And once again, so somebody asked me why you have only a, a here, why it's not a limit, right? So, you know, because in this odd shape, we don't know what the limit is and it's not easy to apply a limit to dA. So we all, we sometimes that's just a way of writing it. When we put A at the bottom of the integration sign, we are just saying um, over the entire area A. Like sometimes we put like this, right? So sometimes we just put I like this for summation. Sometimes of course if you know exactly what you are doing, you can put I equals 1 to N. So that is a limit, right? But otherwise you can just say integrate over all I like that, okay? So A, A, A is something like that. Now we can also define a third one called the product moment of area. Now this also is useful, right? As I will show you not in this lecture but the next lecture, right? So that is of course instead of having now in each of these you have um, uh, you have the multiple of two terms, right? Two distances. Here also you have the multiple of two distances but they are x and y, right? And this is about the x y axis. About the x y axis, right? Over the x and y axis, right? x and y axis, right? So that's called i x y. Okay? So this is just the definition. Now, we talked about the third axis briefly, that is the z z axis, which is perpendicular now to this 
plane, perpendicular to the plane, right? Right? So, um, so that of course will be now this r square, the distance to z axis is r. Now sometimes we call that j naught also. That's, these are just symbols that have, you know, become used uh, over time. So this is called the polar moment of area, right? Uh, so sometimes that is called J naught. Don't ask me why, right? I, I, I don't know why. Maybe you can find out and tell me, right? So that is the integral of R squared. Okay? Now if you think about R squared, that is actually X squared plus Y squared, right? Once again by Pythagoras theorem, right? So then I is a dz, which is equal to R squared dA. We can now uh, break this down by saying it is x squared plus y squared dA, and therefore that it is x squared dA and y squared dA, both integrated. And so lo and behold, we have i y y plus i x x. And so here we have that i is an z equals i x x plus i y y. Later on, we call this a theorem. Actually, we call this the perpendicular axis theorem, right? The perpendicular axis theorem. But uh, Now we try to do some mathematical manipulations. I think some of you will be comfortable with that. And uh, so actually the student who asked me about the integration limits, well, I have made it a bit clearer here, right? So now here, we are now marking an x and y axis. Now in this case, we have cho chosen, uh, chosen this uh, origin as out of this section. This entire depth is D, and so you have D by 2 on top and D by 2 at the bottom. It is in fact passing through the centroid, right? But we don't really need to know that. We don't really need to know that. It's just that half of it is above and half of it is below. This is a rectangle, so this will be uniform right through the depth, right? And so this is the one uh, where actually we should, we should probably know that it's the centroid because this this here is called the second moment of area about its centroidal axis, right? Okay, right. So we are drawing this through the centroid. Okay. So this is a centroidal axis, right? So we can write now Ixx, which is what we need to find, and it will be some kind of moment of area, second moment of area involved in y terms, right? So we say d say y squared into d. So now the dA is everything that is at a distance y from this x-axis, right? So this entire strip here is at a distance y from this, right? And we take an infinitesimal thickness, right? So that's, that's called infinitesimal.
can now apply to this square bracket series of integration, which is minus p by 2 n plus v by 2 r. So this will be plus v by 2 q minus minus v by 2 q. Right? So it will be v cubed by 8 minus minus v cubed by 8, which means plus v cubed by 8. So you get v cubed by 4 there. This v upon 3 is outside the bracket. So, second moment of area of rectangular section about this x axis that is shown is v d cube divided by 12. v d cube divided by 12, right? So, this has uh, dimensions of a to the power of 4, right? Dimensions of a to the power of 4. Let us say that we move this y axis so that that also is a centroidal axis and this y axis is going through that. Right? I didn't draw it like that because it's easier to see it if it's like this. But let us say the y axis is going like this and everything else remains the same. This b and d and everything else remains the same. So can somebody tell me just by looking at this and uh, using sort of logic or whatever, what i y y will be? What is i y y? What's your name? No? Ah, you don't work. Okay, right. Yeah, I won't force anybody. Anybody? You want to have a go? Did you answer before? No. No. Okay, what's your name? Uh, Randula. 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 Yeah. D times B cube divided by 12. Okay, D times B cube, that is D B cube divided by 12. You just switch the D and the B, right? Okay. So, I don't know, maybe all of you saw that, but uh, okay. So, uh, but you can work it out also. So I x x is v d cube divided by 12, I y y will be d v cube divided by 12, right? Okay. Now let's look at a triangle, right? So now in a triangle here, we can try to use the same approach, right? So here the base is b, right? The base is b. This entire height is h, right? So we can try to use the same approach, and we can we can take a strip like this, and we find the second moment of area of all those strips about this line BC, right? And uh, we can make sure that the thickness of that strip is small dy, so that we can use the calculus, right? And we can now try to uh, integrate them, right? So the only thing is, this distance, this distance earlier. So this was a constant, right? This width was a constant. So the only variable was y, right? Now. We have this y uh, going from here to here, but as y goes from here to here, this x also will change. So it's not a constant; it's a variable. It's a variable, right? So we don't like to mess around with two variables, right? We can ask whether we can show y, sorry, show x as a function of y, right? So the way that we can do that is by using what we call similar triangles. So we take this triangle and this big triangle here and we, we write B divided by H that is base divided by height will be equal to base that is X divided by height of this small triangle. So the height is H 
minus y, right? H minus y. So from this we get that x is equal to b into h minus y divided by h, right? So, so we, the second moment of area about b c is the integral of y square d a, right? Now the limit of integration is from zero to h, not from minus d by two to plus d by two. It's from zero to h, right? It's y square, and here this area is is given by x d y where x is given by b into h minus y divided by h and this dy remains, right? So, I have not done this integration, so you can go home and do it, right? Apply these limits of integration, 0 and h. There are two terms that you will have to integrate. One will be a y squared term, right? So, this will be y squared bh, y squared bh, divided by h dy and the other one is y cube divided by h dy right so you will be <coughs> you will get the answer bx cube divided by 12 if you want you can use this you know to remember that it's the same numbers that are involved in this one and this one so these are the bd cube divided by 12 now this is a triangle but this is a triangle and the second moment of area is not about its centroidal axis, right? This is the second moment of area about its base, right? About the base, not about the centroidal axis, right? Okay. So, as an exercise, maybe next time, right? Uh, oh, no, no, at the end of today's lecture. I will uh, tell you to do that yourself. Now, can you try to find the second moment of area about its centroidal axis, right? So, you don't have to, well, you can find the centroid of this if you want from first principles like I taught you, but otherwise the centroid will be h divided by 3 from the base, right? You can use that piece of information, right? Centroid will be h divided by 3 from the base, you all know that, right? Right, okay, so now we have for a circular section, we can use this polar moment of here, right? Circular section, you can use this polar moment of here. So, now here, you see there are different ways now of getting this small element, right? This discretization, right? So I said if you have a very irregular figure, you can divide it up into small triangles, say, right? Now here we are dividing it into what, what are called, what is called an annulus, right? It's called an annulus. That's the that's name given to that shape. circle with a thickness, right? So this is dr. Distance from the axis, the z axis is r, right? So this thickness is dr. So what do we need? We need the integral of r square dA, right? So now what is a? a is this length, or let's say we can say this length. See the thing is dr is very small, when you take this length or this length, that may not change very much, right? Okay? So, uh, so this, uh, this perimeter, no? this 2 pi r, right, 2 pi r into dr, right, 2 pi r into dr is a dA, then the r squared component is there separate, right. So uh, what you have here, you have an r squared here, another r there, so you have an r cube, you are integrating r cube, which means that you will get r to the power 4 divided by 4, right, the 2 pi is a constant, you take it out. Here the limits of integration are from 0 to r0, right, so that's a radius, right, so from 0 to r0, so you will get 5.2 r0 to the power 4, right, second, uh, okay, right, so, so that's a polar moment of it, right, that's a polar moment of it. Now, if you want to find the second moment of area about ixx or iyy, that is not an easy task, that is not an easy task second moment of it, right? Uh, because, so you have this as a tutorial problem also. So if you have Ixx, so you're going through the centroid, then normally what we do is we draw these strips that are parallel to the 
x is concerned. Right, so that is dy. This one is y. This one we can call r. See at whatever level that one will continue to be r. So this one will be square root of r squared minus y squared. So this will be another square root of r squared minus y squared. So Ixx will be integral from this level to that level, 0 to r of 2 r squared minus y squared dy of course times y square. So this is dA, right? It, that entire thing is dA into y square. So this integration is not so easy. It can be done. You must have done it for your A level. Right? Okay. Uh, but there is a much easier way to find i x x from what we have proved earlier. Because we said that i z z is equal to i y y plus i x x. So this is not for a circle, for any section, for any section, right? But in a circle, i x x is equal to i y y, because every line through the center, which is the centroid, uh, is a centroidal axis, right? So i x x will be equal to i y y. So i z z we know for any section is equal to i x x plus i y y. For a circle that is equal to 2 times ixx, so ixx will be equal to half of izz and that will be equal to pi upon 4 into r naught to the power 4, right? So that's a shortcut, right? Why is this? That's called, uh, that's not exactly the perpendicular axis theorem, but that, that's close, right? So, so so we can find this first and from that we can find the second moment of this, right? So this expression here, maybe you can write it down on a side. So this is pi upon 4, r naught to the power 4. Now r is of course d by 2. that will be pi d 4 divided by 64 if I am not mistaken, right? So that is the second moment of area of a circular section about each centroid, right? So this will be i x x, right? Some of these things may not be there in your notes. I think this one is not there in your notes, no? Yeah, so, okay. So, uh, right, I'm sorry about that. Is it there? Okay, okay, halfway is there. Right, 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 okay, halfway is there. Right, okay. So, yeah, so that, that, that's because I wanted to write some things down. Okay? Right. Okay, now, the radius of gyration is also a property that is important. Now it is as if this entire area is concentrated at a distance Rx from this axis, right? Because then you will get the second moment of area about that axis as A times Rx square, right? So we just put this by definition that the radius of gyration is such that A times Rx square will be equal to Ixx. So the radius of gyration is square root of the second moment of area divided by the cross-sectional area.
divided by the area and similarly r y will be like this right and r naught will once again be uh, the same thing that is the corresponding second moment of area in this case the polar moment of area divided by the area okay so especially for those of you who are doing civil engineering right this is a very important property because it controls what we call a buckling phenomenon now i talked about this bar like in earlier in this supporting a fan right but you, if you look on the side there there is a column there right so you have columns there because of those columns only this roof actually the floor above is being supported so you have one two three columns there two three columns there and those are carrying load mostly in compression right so of course the load of the building is quite large right and of course the weight of the fan is quite small but generally speaking you will find that compression elements are quite large that is because compression elements normally do not fail by getting crushed a tensile element will fail by you know, you know fracturing over cross sectional area will not be enough but the compression element very often the cross sectional area is enough to take the stress but before it reaches its maximum possible stress it will buckle like this right that is a phenomenon reserved for compression elements right so how quickly it's going to buckle or not will depend on the length of that element right that is the length divided by what we call the radius of gyration so it depends on which axis right right the, the length divided by the radius of gyration so radius of gyration is extremely important if you want to look at compression and if you want to look at buckling but we don't we don't consider it any further we don't consider it any further in, in this semester one right okay radius of gyration now we come to an interesting theorem right and when, while we are proving this theorem we will get some other ideas about and reinforce some of the ideas that we have learned also during this first lecture right okay now what is done by a parallel axis theorem is that we translate these axes in other words okay this does not look like a centroid but i have put it to a side because uh, it's easier to you know show all these things on the diagram right so you have to pretend that this is the centroid and you have to pretend that x1 and y1 are centroidal axes right now we have done all this stuff so so this is any general shape right so most of the time we will be using fairly common shapes like rectangles sorry what's happening can't hear what is it Anybody has extras of page five? What do you want? Huh? Ah, there we are. Page five. That page five. Right. Okay. Right. If somebody can think of a better way of distributing that, please let me know. That's not page five, is it? Is it page five? Then send it back. now this is a video recording so we must thank uh, ms anuradha peralu kutumagam again right she was earlier in charge of the undergraduate studies division now she is doing uh, uh, some research you know to improve this learning right so uh, we will be putting all of this now uh, well maybe my lecture also video i don't know right so we will be we will get on moodle right so i don't like to put my lecture notes before i have the lecture. so after the second week when i finish this section i will put the powerpoint uh, this powerpoint thing of course you have it in front of you right but i will put that also on moodle so you better get to learn get to know how to use moodle right okay so uh, so if you uh, answer a question correctly then you can see yourself on moodle i suppose right right i right. we see how that works so this is a centroidal axis right now we have done all these calculations so by now we have some 
idea about how to find the second moment of area about a centroid axis. Right? Now suppose we want to find the second moment of area about another set of axes. Can we do that in an easy way without much, much fuss? Right? Okay, without going again from first principles is what I'm saying. Right? So we do what is called a parallel shift of the axis. So this x we bring down here, but this is parallel to this. And this y we take there. That's parallel, right? Sometimes that parallel shift is called a translation, right? So it's not like translation is equal to Tamil, right? Okay, this translation means a movement, right? A movement like that, sort of like a. That's what it is, right? Okay. If you rotate the axis, I will tell you now itself. That is called a rotation. That's simple. So I will cover that actually next time. Right? So we have translation and we have rotation. Right? So this is called the parallel axis theorem because the translation is a parallel shift. Now in order to find the second moment of area about this and about this, we have to of course prove it from first principles and then after we prove it, we can see whether there is a general rule that comes out of it. Okay, so now if you look at this little element B A, right, that will contribute to getting the uh, first moment of uh, second moment of area about x one, and also about x, right? So the first moment of uh, area about x one will be the integral of y one squared d A. The second moment of area about x will be the integral of y squared d a. Right? Now what we have to write simply is that this y, the distance from there to this little element d a, is equal to y bar because once you shift this, it means that this origin here is at a distance y bar from this new axis which you are interested in. Right? So this y is equal to y bar plus this original y bar. Y1 we don't need anymore, but we used it in order to get the second moment of area about that axis. So y is equal to y bar plus y1. Y the same argument, although it's not shown here. X is equal to x bar plus x1. Right? The centroid is x bar and y bar. Right? That is the distance from here. Now we now there are a new set of axes. Right? So the distance from this axis is y bar, and the distance from that axis, which is not shown, is x bar. Now, if we try to find i x x from first principles, we write integral of y squared d a. So, so we substitute y bar plus y one for y. So we have y bar plus y one squared, and then of course you expand this out, which means you get a y bar squared, a y one squared, and a central product or whatever you call it, two y bar y one like that, and all of them. Are integrated over the area A with respect to the area. Okay, right? Now we have three terms for this i x x. We can explore each one of them. And before we do that, we can tidy it up. We can take this y bar out because y bar, remember, now is a constant. It's not a variable, right? It's just a, it's just a distance. So y bar squared we can take out. Now this is just the integral of d A, right? Here we can take two y bar out. Two y bar out because those are constants, and here we have the integral of y one d a, and here of course we have y one squared d a. Right. So what do these terms mean? This one is y bar squared, and the integral over d a of integral of d a over a is simply a, right? All the little d a's are added together. That's just a. So you have a times y bar squared. The second term, you have the integral of y1 d. Now, what is y1 d? What is that called? Sorry. Yeah. What's your name? Shami. 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 Right. Okay. First moment of it. Okay. So let's continue your part this conversation. So, what do we know about the first moment of area about x1, which is a centroidal axis? What is that? What is the value? First moment of the area. 
This one is the integral of y1 square dA.